How many of us have been children? Still. How many of us have had parents? I'm not going to ask how many of us haven't. Some, some people are in that boat. How many of us had, have had parents that care whether or not you get your chores done? There might be some that didn't have parents that cared one way or the other, but I'm not going to ask that question either. How many of us are glad that our parents gave us the instruction and the the uh, baseline instructions on how to please our parents. How fair would it have been if our parents had expectations but never left instructions? I've heard recently, and it sounds like Don had a very similar experience yesterday speaking with the two individuals he was speaking with, that the Bible is one, up for personal interpretation, and two, more like guidelines. How many of us have seen the first uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movie and know what I'm talking about? They're more like guidelines. I don't believe that's the case with the Bible. I think that God went to great effort and great lengths to give us his word and has made a lot of effort put in place on keeping his word true. And he expects us to learn those words and to apply those words and not to just brush them off our shoulders and make excuses as to why we think they're just more like guidelines. So the topic this morning is making a case for the Bible. Two weeks ago, my dad uh, did a sermon that was based on coming out from among them and being separate. It was also ended with one of the verses in this opening passage. Last week, he, he, he talked about taking the word of God and consuming it. In the, in the examples that he brought up, it was as a scroll that was rolled up and then eaten. And it tasted like honey at first, but then it was bitter in the stomach. Part of the reason it was bitter in the stomach is because once you consume the word and you know that there's an expectation about what to do with that word and how to apply that word, you realize that it's not just a story. You realize that it's something that's expected of you and that you have to apply it to your life and actually change yourself with it. I'm very thankful that God is a God that's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. He's given us all of the words that we need in order to please him. I was thinking this morning that Glenn Hoey once taught a lesson up here called The Note, and it was about a parent that left a note with their expectations. I was going to say five years, but that doesn't seem right because things go faster. It was somewhere about 10 years ago. And I remember that sermon very well because my parents used to leave notes. But as I got older and started learning those expectations, those notes became less and less because I had taken that, those words and applied them to my life, and I did not do it perfectly. As I got older, one of the chores that we had to do was dig. And Derek knows this very well because Derek was my digging partner. <laughs> Derek, me, Kalen, and Garrett. Sometimes talking about what superpower would be the coolest one to have. And Kalen had a really lame one. <laughs> yeah, I think it was something like be able to tell what someone was going to say a quarter of a second before they said it. <laughs> well, useful kind of, but really pretty weak superpower. <laughs> Either way, we had to dig literally tons and tons of dirt behind my dad's garage. And You're welcome. yes, <laughs> thank you, Dad. And the, the rule was we had to do like three or four truckloads. And these are not dump trucks. This is a little Nissan pickup. Not a lot. And we couldn't overload it because the shocks were terrible. <laughs> but we had to do three or four, and then we can go down to the public pool. And most days we did that. Some days we didn't. But the rules were explained, and we understood them. We didn't have any excuse. And, and one thing that I knew wouldn't work, so I didn't even try it, was, well, I didn't understand what you meant by the word truck, right? It was very explicit. 
God's word is very explicit. And as Julie brought up in the adult class, he knows what we're thinking. He knows our hearts. He knows whether we understand it or not. So using the excuse, well, they're more like guidelines, won't fly. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 9 through 14, in addition to being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered, searched out, and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. The words of the wise are like goads, and masters of these collections are like driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, be warned, the writing of many books is endless, and excessive study is wearing to the body. The conclusion when everything has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. This passage is just a great summary for the rest of this lesson. There's nothing in here that insinuates that any word of God, that any teaching, that any lesson from him is just extraneous and optional. The words that he's given to us have been collected over thousands of years. I believe I heard there was 40, 40 different authors from three different continents spread out over 2,500 years that made up this book. It's a miraculous thing that this book exists. And he did not do that just so that we could brush off his words. And a God that is going to judge every act, everything that is hidden, whether it's good or evil, is going to make sure that we know what is good and evil. And how would we know what his commandments are to keep unless he's told us? And it wouldn't be fair if we didn't know his commandments and if everybody didn't have access to it. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 17, you find these words. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who want to live in a godly way in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil people and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Wanted to include this part of the passage because it's a snapshot of what not just Paul went through, but what those people that want to follow God will go through. All of the prophets and the writers of the Old Testament, the ones that delivered the words that we still have for us today, went through great lengths and persecutions to present those to us, to be able to be in a state that we can read them today. The people that were put on crosses after Jesus had died because of Jesus' testimony of his death, burial, and resurrection. The apostles, and Paul was included in this, that were stoned, that were beaten, thrown into prison because of their witness of Christ. They did not do that just because it's optional. They did not do that just because ah, it's a guideline. They did that because they based their faith and their hope of salvation on these things. You, however, continue in the things you have heard and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood, you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. So yeah, the purpose of these words are so that we're equipped 
we, I don't have it included in my lesson this morning, but we've referred to the verse many times that we're supposed to be ready always to give an answer. Does that mean that the Bible is really not supposed to be taken seriously, that it's just a, a good book, that it's, that it's something that good people read or, or know about? No. It's something that was painstakingly put in place and very rigorously defended and protected by God throughout the thousands and thousands of years. So that the man or woman may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. Yeah, the instruction sets there. Everything that's important, everything that's beneficial and that's required for us to walk a life that God approves of is written down and is available to us. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, this isn't something that was made up. They didn't all sit down in a room and write a script and say, oh, this would be a really cool story, or this would make a really intriguing <coughs> television show. No, that's not, that wasn't their goal. They did not follow, they did not make up, they did not come up with these cleverly devised tales. They were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such a declaration as this was made by, or to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this declaration made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now, these are men that most of them were put to death because of their conviction and their witness of Jesus and their unwillingness to not spread that truth. This is the same Peter that was in, uh, in a room full of the leaders of Israel, the lawyers of Israel, and said, we ought to obey God rather than men after they had been beaten and thrown into prison. They were convinced of the truths of the Bible, and they witnessed the, the stories that we then have the advantage of being able to go through and read. If, it, if this was all just because they wanted to create a cool story and make up a cool ending, they wouldn't have stuck to it until death. No, they followed this because these are the words of God and these are the prophecies of God being fulfilled in their sight. And they were firsthand witnesses of this. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Continuing on there, it says, and so we have the prophet prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. Now, Don's comments this morning in uh, the adult lesson about the, the two individuals asking him if, if he believed in personal interpretation, I think that this answers that. No no prophecy of scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. Why is that? Why, why can't it be a matter of someone's own interpretation? Well, if it was, how many different interpretations could there possibly be? Well, there's 7 billion people on the planet, so there could be 7 billion interpretations. Currently, what about all the people that came before? There could be billions more interpretations. But how many of those could be true? Assuming they're different interpretations. If they're all in different interpretations, only one of them could be true. All of them could be wrong. But only one could be true if they were all different. But the beauty of the scripture is that it doesn't leave it up for anyone's personal interpretation. The words don't change just because someone else is reading the book. The words are still the words. And we were told in the last passage that they weren't written down 
just because someone wanted to make up a really cool or intriguing storyline. These words were written down for a purpose, and that purpose is salvation through Christ and baptism through him into God's kingdom, all part of God's plan. No prophecy was ever made by the act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. No prophecy was made by the act of human will. Well, then what about fa false prophets? What's it say about false prophets? What does God tell the people of Israel? It says, if someone makes a prophecy and it comes to pass, then those words came from me. But if someone makes a prophecy and it doesn't come to pass, you don't have to fear that person because that didn't come from me. The prophecies that are true are made because God gave his word and those words were uttered or written down by man. That's the next thing that I wanted to talk about. I've heard it said that, well, yeah, God, sure, the Bible is the inspired word of God, but it was, it was written by man, so therefore it's, there's fallibility there. Could be. But when you cross-reference prophets that they are talking about the same events, Old Testament, New Testament, and prophecies come to pass because, as we already know, it can't be someone's own personal interpretation. We start realizing that God uses many men, many women, many prophets to get his message across, and he always tells them, write down these words that I'm going to give you. How many of those prophets write, the words of the Lord God came to me and said, write? All of them. <clears throat> the answer is all of them. The words of Jehovah came to me and said, write. In 2 Samuel, verse, uh, chapter 23, verses 1 through 7, we've been going through uh, Samuel, uh, book of 1 Samuel here in Tony's adult lesson for some time now. So I'm sorry if I'm uh, shortcutting to the end, but looking at how fast we're getting through the first book, it'll be a while before we get here. <clears throat> the, book, the word here says, now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. Okay, is there any question which David we're talking about? Anybody not clear? This is David, King David, same the uh, shepherd David, young boy David. This is David, God's anointed. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. So these aren't his words. Doesn't this agree with what we read back in the New Testament? That these stories and these words were not written down just because some guys in a room thought it'd be a cool story. No, nope, these words are Jehovah's words. The spirit of Jehovah speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. For does not my house stand so with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For he will not cause to prosper all my help and my desire. I'm sorry, for will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? So how much weight does David put on God's word? This is the only passage we're gonna to read today specifically about David, but I can tell you, that David attributed all of his blessings to Jehovah. He attributed all of his faith and he, he walked his life as if God was there. 
there were times that he made mistakes and he paid dearly for them. And every time that that was brought to his attention, he repented. And he gave all of the blessings that came upon him and attributed that to God as well. He continues with, but worthless men are like the thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be taken with the hand. But the man who touches them arms himself with iron and the shaft of a spear, and they are utterly consumed with fire. That last portion there sounds like a prophecy to me. Sounds like a prophecy that lines up with other prophets that are in this book. You see, we start reading here and there a little, and we start understanding that all of the words of God are important. And they're not supposed to be cherry picked for our own personal interpretation, or in other words, our own personal desires. The words of God are to be taken seriously. In Hebrews chapter four, and I think the, that the teen class was talking about Hebrews today. Am I right, teens? Hebrews? We we're in Hebrews today? Adam? We we're in Hebrews today, right? Yeah. So teens, this one, see if you uh, glean any more information. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 8 through 13. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. There's a lot going on in this passage. <clears throat> we talked about what Joshua said to his people there at the, at the end of the adult lesson, that Joshua stood up and told his people that they need to decide that day which God that they're going to serve, whether it's the gods of the land that they were coming into or the gods of Egypt that they just left. Well, had left. 40 years prior. <laughs> but he makes his stance saying that as for me and my house, we're going to serve Jehovah. And then it carries on here and it starts in verse 11 saying, let's strive to enter the rest that God has promised. So that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And then we get into this passage here that says the word of God is living and active. How is it living and active if we haven't, if we haven't added to this book, the Bible, if we haven't had any sort of new edition for the last 2,000 years? Well, is any of it non-applicable today? Did the Bible say anything at all about the internet specifically? In a way, it said that knowledge will increase, right? But does the internet change anything at all about the nature of man? Nope. The same sins that we can do on the internet, they could do 2,000 years ago. And we're doing. Everything that the Bible has to say about any topic that's important for Godliness and our salvation is written there, and it's applicable. This book, being 2,000 years old, does not mean that it no longer is relevant today. If anything, it's more relevant today, because there's more attacking the Bible today. There's more of this insidious, and it, yet it seems, it seems that it's not an attack on the Bible when, said, when someone says, well, yeah, they're like guidelines, but that's an attack on the Bible because it's not just guidelines. What? It's a way of life. It's an expectation. 
Paul tells us here, the word of God is living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. That means the words are not dull. They're not just soft words. They're words with a point. They're words that are set up to divide. And it's the same division as it's always been. Those that choose to follow God and those that choose not to. The excuse may change. But his word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces to the, the division of the soul and the spirit of joints and of marrow. And it discerns thoughts and intentions of the heart. Doesn't that require a very sharp tool to be able to split those things apart and separate them into two different groups? <laughs> and he continues on with this idea that no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I feel that this ties into the two most important laws of God, one being love God with everything that you have, and two being love your neighbor as yourself. And it says that off of those two commandments, all the laws and the prophets hang. It's dependent on those two commandments. If there's any question on our behavior, it can be answered by just thinking about how would I like to be treated if I were the other person? Or how would, how would a God who's a jealous God want to be looked at and respected? And how insulting would it be if you were the God that provided all of these words and instructions that, to have your children say, eh, your words are just, they're more like guidelines. I can choose, choose what to follow and what not to based on my own private interpretation when he's gone to, through such effort to keep his message pure and true. When he's had his children literally sacrificed and his prophets and his sons and his daughters punished because of their witness and their testimony of it to the point of death. To me, that leads, leaves credence to the idea that these words are important. People died to make sure that they were available. They weren't doing it just for some fairy tale. <coughs> and we're going to close today. Another thing that uh, the teen class talked about today, we're going to read the temptation of Jesus. We already talked, I already mentioned that we're supposed to be ready always to give an answer. So we like to say that we are Christians and in that it means that we want to be like Christ. <coughs> And how did Christ defend himself when being tempted by the devil himself? How did he deal with that situation? In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Anybody ever fasted that long? I have fasted five days, and I was hungry. This is a, I would say a whole nother level, but it's like 10 levels higher than that. Well, we do it mathematically, Brent, how many? Eight levels, eight levels higher. I think I still know my math by the time. So after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And I think that's probably an understatement. He was also probably exhausted because when you don't have food for that long. So he had to, I think that part of this is he, is being tempted at his lowest low. <clears throat> he's starving. He's exhausted. So what is his base carnal nature going to be able to come up with against, against Satan? The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. What's wrong with this? Just at face value. I'm not talking about the whole connotation back to Moses and making water out of the stones or, or bread or anything like that. It seems pretty, pretty innocuous, right? But Satan, Satan starts with this, if you are, statement. He's basically trying to get Jesus to prove it. 
And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. How did he know that? Well, because he knew that it was written. So you think it's important that we know what's written? Or is just thinking that the Bible's a good book and it's filled with really good guidelines enough? Well, if we want to be Christ-like, I think he gives us the example here. It's written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Okay, so Satan ups his temptation level here. He actually quotes scripture to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You think it's important for us to know that, that we shouldn't put the Lord our God to the test? Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This last one here, I feel, is extremely impactful. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. I feel that you have, you have basically two options, serve God or serve yourself. When I was a young child, my Aunt Sandy was my teacher for several years there. And we actually went through and looked at every instance we could find in the Old Testament about when the people would serve other gods to find out why they did it. And every instance, they did it because the made up false gods that they decided to serve allowed them to do something in their own up fairy tale that they wanted to do. And that Jehovah said, don't do it. Every time. So this statement here that Jesus says, you shall serve the Lord your God and him, or I'm sorry, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. is basically saying, you're either going to serve Jehovah and worship Jehovah, or you're going to serve yourself and worship yourself. This interaction here, the devil knew the scripture. The devil quoted Jesus scripture. And Jesus didn't say, well, Satan, you don't have the power to give me the kingdoms of, of this time right now. Who is, who does have the power to give the kingdoms of this world right now? Who is the king of this, of this world right now? It's Satan. God's granted that to him. And Jesus knows that he is going to be the king of the whole world. But because of the things that he learned, he knew that the way he's going to get that, the way he gets that title, the way he gets that promise, is not through Satan and worshiping Satan. He knows through the words that are written in the books that we have in front of us, that the way he gets that is through God and fulfilling his requirement to walk according to God's word. Another thing that came to me after I sent this in to cogpoa at gmail.com this morning. Didn't Jesus say that he, that he doesn't know the time nor the hour? Doesn't he say that God's the only one? So Jesus doesn't know when he's going to get that gift. Do you think it was a real temptation when Satan says, I'll give it to you right now? 
that was a real temptation for him because he knows that that's his role and that's what he's going to get eventually. But he doesn't know when. It's the same temptation that we have when we want to do something that we want to do and we think that, oh no, this is more like guidelines because I want to do this thing right now and I think this thing is going to make me happy. If we use that as an excuse, we're being tempted by Satan. And it would behoove us all to remember the temptation of Jesus in that point and think about scripture, which is important to know in the plan of God. Let's go ahead and close with a song. Song number 69, Go and Inquire, number 69. through the ages and through the persecutions of those that wrote it down for us, for your instruction. We ask that you help us to be able to discern those things and apply it to our lives and keep those words forefront in our minds as we go through our lives day to day. We ask forgiveness when we do sin against you and fall short of your expectation. We ask most of all that you save us a place and you remember and have our names written in that book. And that when your son returns to this earth, we are resurrected on that day. These things we ask if it be your will, and in Jesus' name, amen.